We'll be turning to Matthew chapter 28 for our first passage of Scripture this morning. Matthew chapter 28. I would join with my brother Stan in saying I'm glad also to see you all this morning as our worship continues. As disciples, we've come together on the first day of the week to break bread, to remember our Lord and his death, and to engage in other activities of worship, and it is good that we are here for that. We have several good song leaders, and I've noticed a number of times the folks sing well with our brother Kip, and I appreciate his job, his good job, along with that of so many others of you brethren that um, lead us in worship in song. I believe we're fortunate tonight to have scheduled Brother Devin Allen to um, speak in my absence, and I'm glad he is able to come. I rejoice in the men that we've seen grow up, men and women, but I'm speaking now of men that are taking a, a leading part in teaching and other places and continuing to develop their God-given talents, and so he'll be speaking tonight. I'm to be leaving this afternoon and worshiping at um, Bell Green and taking three of our young people with me as we um, get underway for the uh, Young Men's Leadership Camp uh, this next week, the Lord willing. So you'll have a good lesson for this evening, and uh, I know you'll profit from that. The study this morning, as I've mentioned, is looking at Matthew chapter 28 as our first passage of Scripture. And it's going to be a study of the Great Commission. Probably for our audience this morning, there's no need to define the Great Commission. But as we're seeking to make available resources uh, on our website as well, there may be someone to view and listen to view and or listen to our study this morning and wonder what is meant by the Great Commission, why it's called that. There was another commission given during the ministry of Christ that is called, in contrast, the Limited Commission. We've studied recently on Wednesday nights that the apostles were sent forth, and the Bible specifies an occasion, in fact, where 70 were sent forth with the instructions to go preach only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that means to the Jews only within the land of Israel, and they were not to go to other places. They were not to preach to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, but only to the Jews. And their preaching was that of repentance, to believe in the Christ, to believe in the gospel, that the kingdom was at hand. That was the message in the limited commission. But the great commission, unlike the limited commission, the limited commission was given during Jesus' ministry, while the law was still operative, before his death on the cross, before the new covenant was enacted. But in contrast to that, our study this morning of the Great Commission is after Jesus had been crucified and after he was raised up from the dead, the Bible teaches in Acts 1 and verse 3 that Jesus made appearances to the apostles whom he had chosen over a period of some 40 days after he was raised from the dead. And verse 3 says, in which he was speaking to them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so this is after his death. It is after his resurrection. But it is before his ascension that now Jesus said these words that we're about to read together. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Our brother Pender was reading and summarizing passages that have to do with Jesus' suffering and his death. It was by means of his death and his resurrection, that he would be in the position that he is speaking of at this time. That is, now it can be said that he has all authority in heaven 
and earth. This had been given to him by the Father. And so now at this point, having been crucified, having been raised from the dead, he has, Jesus says himself, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. And so what that means is that all are to look to him for guidance, for instruction. The, the question is, what would the Lord have us do? Jesus would say in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He has all authority. He's been given a name that is above all names. He's been given a name before that uh, every tongue should confess and before which every knee should bow to the glory of God the Father. Christ is Lord. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And the word therefore that occurs in the next verse means that uh, on the basis of this, then this is, this is, this follows. Because he has all authority in heaven and on earth, he is the one that gave the great commission that, he, that these men were to go into all the world. As this passage says, they were to make disciples of all the nations, all the nations, not just the Jews as in the limited commission, but because he has all authority. He says, go make disciples, teach all the nations to baptize them and to continue to teach them. We're going to give that a little bit more analysis, but I want to consider also in Mark chapter 16 that you have another record of Jesus again charging the apostles. The same, the, the same scenario in terms of the timing is after his death, after his resurrection, but before his ascension. And he charged the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Again, the resurrected Christ. He did, he did what he did that, that they might be in the position now to go tell the good news. The word gospel means good news. And the good news is that though we have sinned, there is mercy and pardon. The good news is that though all have sinned and the wages of sin is death, Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin. Go preach the gospel to every creature. Again, that's all men, everyone. Preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. The gospel of Luke, you, you see the wording is different, but what we want to keep before us is that Jesus is spending 40 days with the apostles. He's speaking to them about their coming work. He's speaking to them of things pertaining to the kingdom. And he explained to them that it was written, it is written and it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That was necessary. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, uh, I've read after people that would say, well, you know, God could have forgiven sins perhaps in some other way, but he, he did this just to show his great love for us. I'm not sure where people come up with things like that. I don't know that there is any other way. I see the word necessary there. This thing, the, the, the eternal purpose of God, that which is an, under consideration in this passage pertaining to Jesus' suffering, which includes the suffering before the cross, and the cross itself, the instrument of death, and then his resurrection, the, the word in the Bible is that was necessary. That was necessary if we are to be saved. There is no other way. That is the means and the only means. Uh, uh, Peter will say in Acts 4 and verse uh, 13 that there's no other name uh, under heaven given unto men wherein they must be saved. It is through Jesus Christ. It is by his authority. It is by his vicarious suffering on our behalf. And so that's what God has done. The gospel is to be preached and, and so what is required is repentance. Repentance, and then the promise and remission of sins. It's interesting how that you, you, have, you have different gospel records. You have, as I say, Jesus discussing this in different conversations. But you see that, that all the, the response on man's part might be here just summarized. It doesn't say anything about uh, believing. It doesn't say anything about being baptized in this particular passage. It just summarizes it when it says repentance. 
But repentance is brought about by godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, godly sorrow leads to repentance that results in salvation. A repentance that brings no regret, but the sorrow of this world works death. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repentance was to be preached, and repentance is a change. It is a change within the heart. It's a change of mind that results in a change of action. But sometimes you can just use one word that summarizes the whole response. It's not leaving out anything, but it just summarizes repentance. We're, we're guilty of sin. What do we need to do about it? We need to repent. And what is the promise of God? Remission of sins. How does it come about? Well, we have to hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, so it must be preached. But who has all authority? He has all authority in heaven and on earth, so it's to be preached in his name. To whom? To all the nations. Go into all the world. Make disciples of all the nations. But where do you start? Beginning in Jerusalem. And so that takes us looking ahead to Acts chapter 2. So, so much is just said just in these few verses about what Jesus had in mind. But I said I wanted to look at Matthew 28 in, in just a bit more detail. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's not a verse that we just want to read before we get to the rest of what he said. We need to let that sink in. What this means is that everybody is accountable to our Lord Jesus Christ. He has all authority. It's not just if you're a Christian, he has authority over you. Jesus is the king of all the earth. He is Lord of all. The Apostle Peter said in Acts the 10th chapter. He's Lord of all. In fact, Psalm 2 even referred to his rule among the nations. He will rule the nations as, uh, with a rod of iron. And in the book of Revelation, he's seen both as king of kings and lord of lords. And so all are amenable to him. All are, all are accountable to his authority. Men may refuse that and men may reject it. But everyone shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the things that we have done in the body, um, whether it be good or whether it be evil. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. But... God has made him head over all things to the church, which is his body. Ephesians 1 says at verse 22. And so he is the head of the church. He's head over all things pertaining to the church. He has, he has all authority from the standpoint of all the earth. But when it comes to those that are members of his body, every member must look to the head for direction. We should say, and we should mean it, not a step will I take without Jesus. If we understand what it means that he has all authority, then we're always asking the question, well, what did Jesus say about that? What is his will? What does he want us to do? So few people are doing that when you look at the religious scene about us. I hear people all the, t all the time talking about their felt needs. Or I think here's what a church ought to be doing. I think this is what a church ought to offer. I think this, and the church of your choice if Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, I don't have any. No man has any. No group of men have any. The only authority we have is to say what the Lord says. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. What we have the right to do is to teach the doctrine of Christ. What we must do is abide in the doctrine of Christ because he has all authority. That's so important to see. All authority. But notice, because of that, he says, make disciples of all the nations. You may have a translation that says, teach the nations. There's another word that is usually translated teach. But this particular word is the word which means make disciples. In other words, we have a word that means make disciples, which is a noun. Disciple is a noun. You know, nouns are names of person, place, or things persons, places, or things. So a disciple is a noun. But to make disciple takes the same word, it's the same root, except it's the verb part of it. It's making disciples. You make disciples by teaching the gospel. But he says make disciples of all the nations. You teach the nations. And you know what a disciple is? 
by definition, a disciple is one who has been taught. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is a student. A disciple is a pupil. A disciple is a learner. John 6, 44, Jesus says, as it is written in the prophets, no man can come unto me except the Father that sent me draw him. And that's when he then says, as it is written in the prophets, everyone therefore who has heard and has learned comes unto me. Luke 6, 40, a disciple is not above his Lord, or a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is completely trained will be as his teacher. Make disciples. Disciples of whom? Well, not of us, but disciples of Christ. Learners of Christ. Learners of him. Followers of him. To make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so this is part of their being made disciples. The teaching process and the response go together as they're made disciples, as the truth is taught, as Jesus is the solution for sin is taught, and the question arises, are there conditions of gospel obedience? What must I do? Then we see that's where baptism comes in baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How long does that take to do that? In the book of Acts, you will see that there were people that were taught and they were baptized, well, sometimes in that day, Acts 2, verse 41. Um, sometimes it's um, straightway, um, Sometimes the context shows it was right away. Uh, I'm thinking of Acts 16, the same hour of the night that expression is found. And so you have a lot of times an immediate kind of response. The Ethiopian is taught the first gospel lesson he hears by, he hears by Philip. They're riding along in the chariot. He brings it up, look, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? How many lessons had he heard? One. Philip opened his mouth and beginning at that same scripture preached unto him Jesus. And so we, we see that uh, Lydia at, on the banks of the river at Philippi, she hears one lesson and she and her household were baptized. So we see immediacy, we see straightway, we see in that day, we see in that hour when it comes to the first part of the Great Commission. And I marvel at that because this is not something that is simplistic. When you think about the eternal counsel of God, the wisdom of God that no one of us can plumb, and before the foundational world he had this plan, and little by little it comes into fruition, it unfolds before our eyes in the Old Testament, and you think about all the complexity and all the things that were done to bring that about, and the very concept of propitiation and atonement and reconciliation, all that God had in mind for us, and it, it, it's, it, it, it has such complexity and such profundity. And God has taken a message that's so profound and far-reaching. And he's made it simple enough that in a short time, in one session, that you can learn what you need to do to be saved. I marvel at the grace of God. I marvel at the wisdom of God. A lot of people think that uh, the way that they show that they're intelligent is taking something pretty simple and making it so complicated almost nobody can understand it. See how smart they are. But God, who is infinite in wisdom, has taken something that has so many complexities about it and so much profundity and so much depth and he's made it such that we can understand it. And we can know what we need to do to be saved in a short amount of time. It can be the same hour of the night. Just after hearing one lesson. I'm amazed at that. But we also need to see that God's purpose surely doesn't stop there. And as Jesus gave this charge to the disciples, he says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I've sometimes asked the question, how long does that take up, up in verse 19? And we've answered that. It can be one hour. It can be the same hour of the night. It can be a short time. It can be a single session. 
because we see that so many times in the book of Acts where one understands he comes to a knowledge of the truth and he obeys the gospel of Christ. How long does that take? Not long. How long does verse 20 take? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And the answer to that is, and the only answer to that is, the rest of your life. That's your call as a disciple. That's where it comes in to be a living sacrifice. That's where our business is to go about proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Proving it in our lives. Continuing to fight the faith and to the, the, fight the good fight. The fight of faith. And to fight against sin. Continuing to crucify the flesh and let Christ live in us. That's the rest of our life. That's discipleship. But I'm wanting to explore this text just a little bit further. I want to especially zero in on that expression, in the name. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now it, it may seem at first glance that because the statement has just been made in verse 18 that Jesus has all authority, that this is another way of saying the same thing. He has all authority, and so uh, we've already said the Great Commission, therefore, to preach and teach is by his authority. We've said that. And so one might reason that when he says to baptize in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, that people might that, that we might just conclude that, that that in the name of here means by his authority. And you have in Acts 2 and verse 38 the expression to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And there it does mean by his authority, by the authority of Christ. But I want to suggest to you that this is a passage that is in fact full of meaning. In the name of. Perhaps you have heard that the American Standard of 1901 is one of the more literal word-for-word -word translations of Scripture. That is, a, that is a true statement. And in the rendering of, of the American Standard of 1901, it renders this baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is intriguing to me to notice how full of meaning that is. And this is a passage that has given me great joy just to contemplate the meaning. That, that this is not the word that is used in Acts 2.38, N, transliterated E-N. It's another word, it's the word ace, E-I-S. And Art and Gingrich in their lexicon make this statement, and this is always when you look up a term you need to make sure they're talking about the passage you're looking at and the wording that, you know, and you don't just grab some definition. But this is when they're discussing the Greek word for name, name, anima. And, you, and when they look at, in particular, and specifically at the expression in the name, as used in Acts, in Matthew 28. So they're talking about this expression in our passage and, and what, what that means. Ace the name. Ace ta anima into the name of. Here's what Arden Gingrich say about the word as is used here. That through baptism, and, in and, and they, they have the Greek word spelled out, and I've transliterated it, ace, the one who is baptized becomes the possession of the one whose name he bears. So that very literally, the text is saying that when one is taught, when one is scripturally baptized, by scripturally baptized I mean baptized according to the teaching of scripture. Not every baptism is a scriptural baptism. But he enters, he enters into a sphere, a spiritual state that he was not in before. He becomes something he was not. He becomes the possession of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one whose name he bears. 
I love that. Now I know, I know that something is not true just because some man says it. But what I'm saying is that these men are accurate in terms of, of the, the, the wording that we're looking at here is not something we want to overlook. That is very literally, in the name, into the name, the name of God stands for all that he is. The name of the Father is the Father and all that he is. The name of the Son, that's Jesus and all that he is. The Holy Spirit, his name represents all that he is. And so to be, here's the thing, people look at that again casually and it's like, Okay, this is saying what the person who does the baptizing is to say. So that you, say, you recite this formula, you say, I now baptize you in the name of the, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm not making light of that. It is right to say what we were doing. But if you read this passage and think that the, that the apostles are being given some baptismal formula, you've missed the point. If you read this passage and think that Jesus is telling them what they are to say at baptism, you've missed the point. He's not telling them what to say, he's telling them what to do. You baptize them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So here one is in Satan's realm, here in sin one is in darkness, here in sin one is outside of Christ, but that changes when he hears the gospel and he is baptized into the name of into the possession of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Could I make a recommendation to you? Turn off the noise, turn off the music, get away from distraction, and just think about that, meditate on that, think about the significance of that. That this is what God wants. He wants you to be His possession. He wants you to belong to Him. He wants there to be a relationship such that he is saying, this person is my possession. He is mine. And so that on this end, we're saying, I am his. That's what God wants. To be baptized in the, into the name, into the possession of. And as I've explored that further, again, it's, it's just a concept that I have wanted to be able to more than just cite the passage. But, but to see what is involved in this, and, and again, in looking at the word baptism, ace literally into the name, the observation is made. Notice it is the name, not the names. So the word singular, name, but it's the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, points to the unity of these three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think that is a correct observation. But... Again, this source on the word, this expression, literally into the name, means fundamentally determined by. This baptism brings a person into an existence that is fundamentally determined by, that is ruled by, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that saying a mouthful? And doesn't it make sense? If we are the possession of the Father, if we truly belong to Him, if in baptism we enter into that relationship where we are His possession, then this relationship is determined by Him, by the Father, by the Son, by the Holy Spirit. An existence that is fundamentally determined by and ruled by. So you're not just getting baptized. When you're scripturally baptized, you're in a relationship determined by, ruled by, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that essentially what Paul said when he said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He's in a relationship that is determined by the Father, by the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. That has given me, as I say, uh, joy. And great pleasure to see that in giving these words, that this is the kind of thing Jesus is wanting. This is, this is what he's talking about. And if you, if you were to really understand the words of Christ and what happens when a person is baptized as the Lord teaches, who wouldn't want to be baptized? And who would be quibbling and saying, well, I don't see what water has to do with it, or what about the thief on the cross, or... 
who wouldn't want to be the possession of the Lord? Who would not want to be in a relationship ruled by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to belong to them? In the book of Acts, we see how the Great Commission was carried out. Can I ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 1? If I ask you who wrote the book of Acts, would you know that right off? The author of the book of Acts? The author of the book of Acts, uh, his name is not Acts. His name is Luke. And Luke wrote the book of Luke too. Luke also. In Acts the first chapter, writing to the same man Theophilus, which means a friend of God, the first book, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Have you ever wondered about what Luke meant when he said that? First he's talking about the book of Luke, but he says concerning what Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now when you read those first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you have the impression that Jesus did not fully do what he came here to do? Do you have the impression that Jesus just partly did the will of God? Well, no. You have the distinct impression he fully accomplished everything he was sent to do. He fulfilled the law in its entirety. He fulfilled prophecies about him. He was sinless. He died just like the Bible says. He was raised from the dead the night before the crucifixion. He says, I have finished, I've accomplished the work that you have given me to do. He, if he, as he prayed, I have glorified you on earth. As he's about to receive back into glory, his, his words on the cross, Father, it is finished. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Jesus accomplished, he finished the work that he came here to do. And yet Luke says, when I was writing about Luke, I was writing about what Jesus began to do and to teach. There's not a contradiction. Though Jesus finished and accomplished everything he came here to do, that wasn't all of God's plan. That is to say, Jesus did what he did in accomplishing his great redemptive work for us so that Luke, Luke is saying it this way, so that the apostles could continue that work that Jesus began, so that they could carry out the commandments that he had given to them. But he's looking at what he's about to record, not as something separate from or distinct from the Lord's work. But now Jesus began to do these things, and here's what the apostles did. So we read that, that he fully accomplished everything he came here to do. But he did what he did so that these men could do what they did. And that's how the word begin or began will make sense there. Because he refers, do you see that in verse 2 when it says, after through the Holy Spirit, until the day he was taken up. After he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now Jesus gave a lot of commandments to the apostles. All during his ministry, he gave lots of commandments. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is what we've been talking about this morning. When it talks about the commandments he had given the apostles he had chosen, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Make disciples of the nation. Those are the commandments he, had, he has given that Luke is saying, that's what I'm going to write about in the book of Acts. And so when you come to Acts chapter 2, what do you have? Pentecost. People are from everywhere. After gaining the crowd's attention, you see Peter preaching, men of Israel, hear, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. He preached Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 40 
Verse 41 says that that day 3,000 did so. But look at the next verse. In verse 42, they continued steadfastly. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Don't you see how it all comes together? Beginning at Jerusalem, repentance and remission of sins was to be preached. Make disciples of all the nations. Preach Jesus. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He's preaching Jesus. He calls upon them to know for certain that Jesus is Lord and Christ. When these believers ask, what shall we do? Thing is, you may have heard this lots of times. They didn't know if there was any hope at all. Have you thought about it from their perspective? They've never heard the words of the Great Commission before. From their perspective, when they said, what shall we do? Peter could have said, nothing you can do. It's just hopeless for you. I mean, they don't know. They don't know what's going to be the answer. How relieved they were when he said, repent and be baptized. But right down the line, Peter is carrying out the Great Commission. But that's part one. As these people of verse 41 become the possession of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as they're in a relationship determined and ruled by him, remember the second part of the Great Commission? Teaching them to observe all things. That's where verse 42 comes in. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. And that, friends, is the, is the story of the book of Acts, where you see it, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Men and women, different races, different backgrounds. Some were knowledgeable of Scripture, some were idolaters, all heard the same gospel. All were obedient to the same gospel. And when they did that, all were added by the Lord to his church. My friend, what a difference the gospel makes. There are exceeding precious, there are great promises if we render obedience to the gospel from our hearts. Again, in the possession of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know that there's a God-given need that we have to belong? Did you know that? Why do you think some people are in gangs? Is it because they just really like everything about a gang life? They want a sense of belonging. They're going to, be, they're going to belong somewhere even if it's a bad place. I'll tell you where I want to belong first. I want to belong to God, to, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful promise. Remission of sins, all spiritual blessings, access to the very throne of grace, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and as we continue to be faithful to the Lord, the promise of eternal life. His invitation is to all. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. There may be someone this morning who's left your first love as a child of God, and you need to come back to the Lord in repentance and prayer. And we would be glad to help you with that. But there may be someone who has not yet been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. You've heard what you need to know this morning. There's no reason to delay. Surely these are things that you want to have. And you, know, you don't know if you'll have another opportunity. I wonder, is there someone now that would make that great confession that would let us assist you in being baptized into Christ? All together we stand and sing. Amen.